Hello and a very warm welcome indeed to Quadriga coming to you from the heart of Berlin and it's been a dramatic week in German politics with another painful setback for Martin Schulz, the Social Democrat leader who's hoping to challenge Angela Merkel for the chancellorship in September's national election. In the hugely important state of North Rhine-Westphalia, Angela Merkel's Conservatives notched up a third win in a row in a regional poll, a powerful signal that sends out, being sent out that suggests that the Chancellor looks set for a fourth term in office in the autumn. Martin Schulz, meanwhile, is down, if not yet quite out, and some pundits are saying he'll need a miracle to beat Chancellor Merkel. So our question this week on Quadriga is Merkel versus Schulz. No contest. To discuss that question, I'm joined here in the studio by Ulrike Herrmann, who is a business editor for the Berlin Daily, the Tageszeitung, or Tats. Ulrike says the only chance that Schulz has is to show that he's something very different from Angela Merkel. He must not be seen as a copy of the Chancellor. Also with us is Matthew Karnichnik, chief editor and European, chief European correspondent at Politico who believes the problem for the Social Democrats is not Schulz, but Merkel. And a warm welcome also to Anna Zauerbrei, senior editor at another Berlin daily, the Tagesspiegel. She says Schulz can't catch up now. Merkel's CDU has got September's election in the back. Well, we'll have to wait and see, Anna. <laughs> I'd like to begin with you, Ulrike Hammond. Tell us about just what an important week this has been in German politics. Yeah, well, Martin Schulz originally thought that he had the chancellorship secured. And after this three elections, he has to realise that, in fact, he's already almost lost the election four months before it is held, because in all those three elections that were all regional elections... All regional politics, yeah. but yeah. they were mm. very important elections. Uh, it was always the Conservative candidate that won in the end. And what is even more important, all these three candidates from the Conservative Party who won the elections are very close allies of Merkel. So Merkel not only won all these uh, elections, she also gained a lot of power within her own party. So that you can be sh quite sure that the Conservative Party now will stand uh, in, uh, <laughs> in close attendance to anything Merkel wants. Mm -hmm. And so she uh, does not have to fear that the very Conservative part of her party will somehow always disagree and uh, be... Um, a disruptive force during the election campaign. So for Merkel, it's now very easy, and for Schulz, it's very difficult. Anna Zorbray, what do you say? How surprised were you by this defeat for Martin Schulz's Social Democrats in their heartland state of North Rhine-Westphalia at the weekend? I actually wasn't that surprised because mm. um, the tendency sort of showed that uh, the Conservatives were picking up and that it would be a very, very close race. And um, the surveys actually weren't that bad. They showed just a couple of percentage points difference before the race, so it was absolutely possible. And the long-term trend, from my point of view, pointed towards um, a Conservative win. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe what the election shows is that people prefer security over what Martin Schulz promises, which is social justice. It's yeah. Security is the major point they want to be made by their policymakers in Berlin and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that Schulz will not be able to embody um, like the Conservatives and Angela Merkel can embody it. So I think he'll just be sort of a faint grey copy um, if, he, if he tries oh, dear, that. Dear, dear. So. <laughs> I just quoted you as saying that you believe that Angela Merkel's Conservatives have the September election in the in in the bag. Is it? Is, are you really convinced? I mean, we look. We uh, this is a time where we're being taught time and time again that it's the political landscape is highly volatile, highly unpredictable. You're nodding. I see you. you yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly yeah. true. Anything can change. There's four months to go. I know, I know it's sort of a, a bold prediction, um, but yeah. I believe that the long-term trend points towards Merkel. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the surveys, uh, she's had a low point in early 2016, which was caused by her humanist approach, um, her humanist answer to the um, refugee crisis. And ever since um, the Conservatives... I'm, I'm just doing the maths here, Anna. That, that, uh, early 2016, that was when you wrote a piece in the New York Times saying that the Merkel era is yes, effectively but I didn't say, over. Yes, I know, but you I... You came sure, we discussed. <laughs> Yes, it at the I know. Time, yeah? But it, 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 the piece wasn't about um, the, that, that she couldn't win another chancellorship, but it was about how the movement
mood in the country has changed and how like we are going towards um, much more conflict within society and sort of the 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 very cozy Merkel feeling had gone and um, I think so so th that was for me that was like um, really a break with other traditions we've had in our political culture so I didn't I wasn't really saying that she wouldn't win again um, what I see now is that um, the mood has calmed down and we're sort of entering the Merkel era again because um, there's not that much disruption anymore in the public discourse and it's caused by policy changes the conservatives have made. They have picked up on the mood. They have, um, uh, they have together with the Social Democrats, um, done a lot of changes to the asylum uh, laws and um, have introduced a lot of restrictions and security measures. And I think people are rewarding that. And um, this is what makes them the original. And this is what people will vote for when they vote security in September 2017. Matthew Karnichnik, what have you got to say about all that? Well, I completely agree with the with the security point. I, I, I would say, without calling into question uh, Anna's uh, forecasting uh, prowess, I, I, I don't think it's that bold to say that Merkel will win at, at this stage. We are four months out. And, uh, you know, there was a blip here during the uh, refugee crisis where Germans lost some confidence uh, in Merkel. And ironically, because she was really sort of driven, in my view, by the AFD, by the right wing populists mm -hmm. here, she cracked down on uh, the refugees. It's become much more difficult to get asylum in this country than it was. And uh, that is something that a lot of people wanted. And, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it's working. I think for the SPD right now, the most troubling part of that election or these three elections that, that you mentioned is the fact that the uh, CDU under Merkel, for the first time since she became chancellor, I believe, managed to win back states from the SPD. She's been chancellor since 2005. And since then, the CDU lost one state after another. And now in very short uh, succession, they've won back a number of states, including the biggest state. So that's got to be a very worrying sign on top of everything else that the SPD is going through right now. So it's difficult to see a path, to be honest, where the uh, SPD, despite the volatility in, in you know voter attitudes and despite the volatility in the world right now, I would argue that precisely because the world has become uh, so unpredictable, in part because of Donald Trump, but there are other issues as well, Brexit that y you mentioned. But these factors, I think, will drive German voters to Merkel because they want this reliability, this perception of stability that they have. And so I don't see a way right now uh, that she could lose, to be honest. Mm. You talked about North Rhine-Westphalia, the significance of that state as, as being the most significant of these three electoral defeats in a row for Martin Schulz. Let's just listen in to what Martin Schulz uh, said about the significance of North Rhine-Westphalia before the vote actually took place. When the results are announced on the evening of May the 14th, the Social Democrats will be the strongest party in North Rhine-Westphalia and Hannelore Kraft will still be state premier. I'll be paying close attention when those results start coming in, because they will show that the SPD is going to be the strongest party in Germany and that I will be Germany's next Chancellor. Matthew, we've used the word bold twice already in this discussion this evening. That was a very bold statement. How much of a blow to Martin Schulz's credibility is a statement like that? Setting himself up as the Chancellor and then being brought down. Well, I think that in combination with a couple of other things that happened during that period, he was uh, elected, if you remember, as chief of, of the SPD with 100% of, of the membership uh, that voted that day, which was an extraordinary thing. And people compared it jokingly to North Korea and places <laughs> like that. So he really was riding on this this wave where he seemed in, 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 invincible. But even then, people were warning, well, you know, this, this is what they called the Schultz crashing. effect at the they time. They called it the, the, the mm. Schultz effect. And a little bit like a souffle, he, it's kind of all the air has come out of it now. And he's sort of standing there and is, is much more circumspect, circumspect about his prospects now. I would, would uh, repeat, though, that I don't know that it's so much about Schultz as it is uh, about Merkel. And it's interesting that her rise in recent weeks, and this has really only happened over the last six weeks or so, uh, has coincided with a few uh, important markers, I think, in particular, beginning with her trip to Washington to Donald Trump, mm -hmm. where, you know, Germans again could see their leader there standing up to 
Donald Trump. She's being taken seriously by him. She's not letting him uh, push her around. And I think that that really goes down well here. This is the advantage that she has. She met Putin recently, and it was sort of a, a similar dynamic. And remember, this summer you have the G20 meeting in, in Hamburg, which yeah. will give her an even bigger stage to show that she is the world's preeminent stateswoman. Martin Schulz uh, doesn't have any of these advantages. He's going to spend the next months um, making his case on market squares around Germany, and I, I think that's a big disadvantage. Mm. If you were, Ulrike, if you were Martin Schulz's campaign manager, what advice would you have for him at this point in time? He's in a, he's in a difficult place. Yes, but as I said, uh, Merkel, um, Schulz will never ever have the chance if he uh, tries to be a copy of Merkel. He mm -hmm. cannot be the state leader. He isn't. That's her. And But I think that, uh, and I disagree with Anna when she says that the internal and external security is all that Germans worry about. There are very many Germans, not everyone, but about 50% of the Germans uh, are worried about their own social security. They we have a boom. Economically, Germany is very stable. And nonetheless, half of the population, 50%, say that it is very unjust how Germany is functioning, socially unjust. And another 50%, I mean the same 50%, say that they themselves do not profit from the economic growth. Now, these 50% wait for, some, for, for someone to come to tell them, well, your security issues, social security issues, are safe with me. I've got a program to address three major issues that are troubling very many Germans. That's that uh, uh, living in the cities gets very expensive mm -hmm. because uh, you have to pay a lot of rent and it's always rising. Next thing, very many people do not have enough income when they retire. That is a growing crisis. And then there are very many people who do just do not earn a lot of money despite having a job. So, and uh, people want to have answers for that. And the social democrats have to have solutions for these problems. And the pro uh, and, but until now, and that's the, I think the real problem why Schulz is losing out, they don't have any program. They, uh, it's only, uh, you know, Schulz runs around the country and talks about social security and social justice mm -hmm. and no one Really, no one, the voters and the journalists, no one, they just don't know what he means with that. Mm -hmm. And that cannot continue. Anna, you're nodding. Yeah, I agree. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I do think uh, that not having a pro pro a program, program is... is uh, <laughs> but that was just a... That was a, a program yeah, Ulrike has just written a program for Germany, <laughs> yes. Social Democrats. Yes, yeah? they and should ask me. <laughs> but I think that the one item that would sort of be lacking and uh, which the Conservatives can, can better uh, a body than Schulz can ever is, the, um, is that the, the insecurity when it comes to identity. And um, I think this is something that many people feel very insecure about. Where is this country going culturally? Um, when you look at surveys, um, about half of the Germans say they're in some way or another afraid of Islam. And every fifth German even holds hostile views towards Muslims. And I think that is something that the um, social democrats just cannot address in the way the um, conservatives can address it with, for example, the light culture uh, debate that was just started by um, mm -hmm. the Minister of the Interior, Thomas de Maizière, with... Uh, light culture being a very German, heavy German yes, word, implying yes, that there's a sort so of a core, a central German culture, a yes, national culture. Yes. Yeah. That, that should be reinforced um, and with demands for a ban of the burqa and demands for a law for Islamic communities. Um, so this is something that the Conservatives can give the voters, but the, mm. the Social Democrats cannot sell. Yeah, but I think just to counter with another survey, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. All, all you say about Germans, uh, the uh, ideas about culture is true. But on the other hand, you know, those voters from for the right-wing party, AFD, um, they say in surveys that 85% of them feel economically insecure. Now, if you give them the ch chance to decide whether they want to have economic security, which is somehow uh, proposed by the C uh, SPD, hopefully, mm -hmm. or whether it's just against Muslims, I think many of them will decide that it might be a better idea to vote for the so social security and not to care about the Muslims anymore. And I think uh, because uh, you, I think it is a very 
it would be a very strange idea to think that many people would somehow think that cultural security is more important than their own social security. Yes, I have to say, I'm, yeah. I'm just somewhat skeptical about these surveys saying yeah. that you know Germans are so worried about their economic future. It, it, it might be true, but it's not being shown in the results from from these elections, quite yeah, but frankly. Because the, the social chance. democrats don't have any well, program they, addressing yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that do, don't they? I don't know. I mean, they could have <laughs> they could have voted in uh, the 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 Linke, the really left wing party, together with the Greens and together with the Social Democrats in North Rhine-Westphalia. Instead, they voted in the, the, the center-right together with a business-friendly uh, liberal party, the FDP. So given the chance, they went in the completely opposite direction, even though there are plenty of people in North Rhine-Westphalia uh, who might not be doing that well economically. So I wonder if there's something else going on here. I mean, I think to people outside of Germany to hear that there's all of this social struggle and that there's all of this angst about their economic position might be surprising, because if you compare Germany just looking at you know the main indicators to other countries, it's actually doing quite well. They have full unemployment. The uh, economy is growing uh, much stronger than it is in, in, in most of Europe at the moment. That but doesn't I mean that people should... aren't suffering, but overall, I think that things are quite are quite good here. But I think yeah, that's uh, true. But I think we somehow are approaching a situation that is more or less like the one of the United States. In the United States, you also have full employment, but it's not about being unemployed. It's about no, uh, working and not uh, earning enough. So, uh, and, you, and you know what that leads to in the United States. You have full employment and nonetheless, people vote for uh, someone like Trump. And that's social protest. And probably if uh, Bernie Sanders had been running against Trump, he would have been voted for. So, you know, and you have the same situation basically in Germany. You have full employment, but very many people do not profit from the economic growth. And that in Germany, that's still underlying... Uh, uh, it's hidden by other issues like how do we feel about Muslims and uh, I don't know what, but it would be very important for a party in Germany to address a big party, not the Links party, which is very small, a big party, party yeah. to mm -hmm. address these issues. Mm -hmm. OK, before we continue, I'll come back to you, Anna. Let's just listen in again to Martin Schulz, because he says he is going to put up a fight uh, using a boxing metaphor. Let's listen to it. <laughs> in boxing, sometimes you take a hard blow to the body, but that doesn't mean that your opponent is going to win the next round. I'm a veteran campaigner, and behind me stands the leadership of the Social Democratic Party. We're determined to take on this challenge, to deal with it effectively, and to bring about a successful result for our party and for our country. We can't write him off yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's a man of great resolve. He's overcome adversity in his private life, we know, you know, several times. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't even think. I think he's a fighter, and and he will he will put up a fight. Mm. Um, but uh, I think that just the, the circumstances are sort of against him. And um, as I said that, and, and I want to pick up what uh, Ulrike Hermann said um, uh, just before the break. Um, people do worry about their material security, of course, but then they can get that with the Conservatives too, because they are promising tax reliefs, like billions of tax reliefs for middle-income classes Yeah, but too. they will profit they... only the rich. That's already been calculated. The rich and, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is um, true. But I think also the upper middle class, and, and there are a lot of those voters who change from voting SPD to voting for the Conservatives, like, every time. And we've seen, like, a 350,000, I believe, of the voters who voted for the Conservatives in North mm -hmm. Australia came from the Social Democrats. So there is a big bulk of voters who go forth and back. And um, I believe if they feel they can expect some tax reliefs and maybe if they're not married um, and then have a child, they can get some benefits. Um, they will actually put the identity question first, but I, that's very hard to prove. It's just a gut feeling I have. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Matthew has already mentioned that Angela Merkel has a huge advantage that she's out there on the international stage where uh, her opponent is, uh, it doesn't have that exposure to the international audience. Let's just have a look to confirm that. And then I've got a question for Matthew. Angela Merkel simply does the job she was elected to do. She governs. She welcomes heads of state, like newly elected French President Emmanuel Macron. or meets Russian President Vladimir Putin in Sochi, or takes part in a women's summit in Berlin featuring Ivanka Trump. The Chancellor can draw on vast reserves of political capital. Martin Schulz cannot. 
How much of an advantage does that give Merkel? Well, a huge advantage, you already said, Matthew, but what is the... We've talked a little bit, or a lot, about the Social Democrat mantra of social justice. What is the message that Angela Merkel is whispering in the ears of German voters that makes her so persuasive and so apparently unbeatable? Well, I think it'll be the same slogan, essentially, that she's used in her past re-election campaigns, which is, you can trust me, you know me, you can trust me, I represent stability, I represent the status quo, uh, which is why I have my doubts, not for any ideological reasons, but I just wonder how many Germans really feel that they're, uh, you know, about to slide into poverty or something, because given the chance, again, in North Rhine-Westphalia, the, the left party, which is to the left of the SPD, didn't even get into the into the state parliament, which to me was also a signal, well, maybe these issues aren't really uh, resonating, even though they don't necessarily have a, a clear program, but the CDU doesn't have a clear program in that regard either, because as you said, you know, these tax cuts and all of this type of thing, well, they might help the upper middle class, they might help the middle class, but these aren't people that are necessarily worried about how they're going to pay their rent next month. So I do think that there's a sense that Germany is doing well, uh, we need to have Merkel in the, the chancellery to ensure that uh, also Europe, which we haven't talked about, uh, doesn't come undone. And I think that, you know, these are all in, important issues and it is, an, it is a question of trust. Not that people don't trust Schultz, but he's, he's really untested. It's worth remembering that he's never really held an executive office. He's been in, uh, the, European Parliament in the European Parliament for uh, the last couple of decades. Before that, he was uh, mayor of a, of a small town. Uh, so he, he doesn't really have the same uh, kind of experience. He's never even been a minister. So Mm -hmm. I mean, I think these are all things that are going to come into play as people make their decision. Well, when you talk about Europe, who's going to take up this question? Emmanuel Macron, we just saw him in those images there visiting Germany, the new French president. Who can best form a tandem with Macron, Merkel or Schulz? Who could, because Macron says that together with Germany, he's going to mould a new Europe. Who's more suitable for that role of the two? Well, well the problem will be that uh, there cannot be any alliance between France and uh, Germany because, you know, at the right moment the German economy is hitting the French economy very hard by our export surpluses and Macron made very clear that he will address the issue of German uh, export surpluses and uh, unfortunately also the SPD thinks that having export surpluses is a very good idea. So uh, Macron will crush against any politician that comes from Germany no matter whether it is uh, Schulz or Merkel. Anna. Maybe in this point, but I think what we saw in the past days was actually quite hopeful because uh, Macron both, uh, like the, the, they, even before Macron really started to govern and even before we know who's going to govern Germany uh, after 2017, some of the most uh, critical points in this axis were sort of um, swept off the table. Um, Schäuble, the Minister of Finance in Germany, said in several interviews that he would be willing to have a European Minister of Finance with an own budget, which is something the French or, and Macron has, have got in their program for the European Union. And then um, on the other side, Macron said when he came to Berlin that, well, he doesn't insist on euro bonds, so on a communali further communalization of um, debt in Europe. So I guess that, that tandem actually could work out, and I think it will work with both of them. It will work with Merkel and Schulz. Matthew, you, uh, you asked the question initially. What's your answer? I, I, I think that uh, it, it doesn't really matter probably whether it's Schulz or Merkel on that front because it's clear uh, with all of the stress that the euro has been under, with all of the stress that the eurozone has faced in Greece and other places that something needs to be done here. I agree that nobody wants to address these issues now. Neither the SPD nor the CDU is going to say we need to do something about this imbalance in Europe with Germany being this strong exporter. Uh, but I think Merkel especially knows that, that things can't continue now because the result would be that you know the, the the euro would fall back into crisis, and there's no country that benefits more from the euro than than Germany. And with with Brexit now on the table, and all of these other uh, challenges that Europe faces, I think that this is the moment where France and Germany are again going to have to lock arms and do something. It might not be quite as dramatic as you know the French might be hoping with the European or Euro, Eurozone budget or whatever, but something something needs to happen here. And I think it's interesting and maybe a little bit unfortunate that, that Europe isn't playing a bigger role in, in this campaign so far because neither party, I think, really wants to acknowledge what will need to be done, which means that Germany is going to have to pay more if they want mm. to uh, keep Europe intact. In 
How come, after 12 years in office, Ulrika, when you talk about the social injustice that you have mapped out, how come, I'll give you, I'll give you one minute on this because we're running out of time, but I'm, I'm really fascinated to know what you're going to say. How come there is no, not more Merkel fatigue in Germany, 12 years in? Uh, because she was the most gifted politician Germany ever had. Same question, Anna? I agree. Uh, I think she's an institution. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not for me, that's what Tina Hildebrand wrote today in Die Zeit and I think it's absolutely, it, it just, it's so down uh, to, to what's really the point. It's, Most gifted politician and institution, Matthew, your take? Well, I would argue that she's almost an anti-politician, that she, she doesn't have <laughs> any real ideology. She's a pragmatist and, and she's a product of this time in which we live in, where ideology no longer plays such an important important role so she can switch her position on things very quickly the refugee crisis being uh, perhaps the best the best example for okay. her. thank you very much for that thank you all of you for your for your views we've been talking about merkel versus schultz no contest it's been a fascinating discussion if we've given you food for thought join us next week again on quadriga until then bye bye and tschüss